Um, welcome everyone uh, who is joining us, apparently from all over the world. Um, we are thrilled just to, to be here today to have uh, an interactive uh, webinar. Um, Roy is our esteemed host. Um, I am coming to you from San Francisco, Barry from San Diego, um, and I'll let Roy um, have his introduction a little bit later. Um, today's session is uh, in a meeting format, so we do encourage folks if you'd like to share your video and uh, share your audio when it comes to Q&A to feel free to, to join in and interact. Um, and in the meantime, during the presentation, you can also hide your video and mute yourselves um, so that we have the most opportunity to interact with the Q&A. And I'll kick it over to you, Barry, thanks so much. Hey, thanks, Leanne. So my name's Barry Berman. I am the president of the Booth Alumni Club of San Diego, as well as the University of Chicago Alumni Club of San Diego. I did my undergrad and my MBA at UChicago. Um, so welcome to everyone. Uh, my job here is to give Roy the great introduction that he deserves. Um, this is Roy Nakamura, who is president of Horizon Web Marketing. He is a Chicago Booth grad with his MBA in finance. He's also a CPA. He uh, has a bachelor's degree in engineering and a master's in journalism, along with some graduate work in Tokyo. He spent 25 years in Silicon Valley uh, in corporate finance, but currently he runs an internet marketing company. And Roy was kind enough uh, because of his experience in internet marketing to approach me to see if there would be any interest in uh, sort of picking his brain about the topic. Um, and clearly based on our attendance today, quite a few people are interested in this topic. Um, Roy also serves on quite a few boards, including the United Way, the Financial Executives International and the Chamber of Commerce. He was the business person of the year for the Las Vegas Asian Chamber of Commerce in 2018. And Roy currently does reside in Las Vegas. Um, and he lives with his wife, a COVID puppy named Phoebe, um, <laughs> who sounds adorable. And he has two grown daughters who are in the Bay Area where, as I mentioned, uh, Roy spent a significant amount of time uh, during his career. So Roy, provided that I have not left out anything, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the rousing introduction, Barry. I wanna thank the University of Chicago uh, for setting this up. Leanne, thank you, Caroline, if you're here. And also to, to, to Barry um, Berman, from the San Diego chapter and Ben Feltz. Um, in my opinion, they're the most friendly and most welcoming University of Chicago alumni chapter. I live in Las Vegas and I was kind of like an orphan and they kind of let me uh, join their, um, their meetings and just amazing people. And so if you're looking for an online chapter to join, I strongly recommend checking out the San Diego chapter. So let me uh, switch to my screen and just kind of jump right in. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen. So this is entitled Eight Things CFOs and Business Owners Need to Know to Win in Internet Marketing. I'm gonna go at a fast pace. So if I go too fast, um, just, just please let me know. And this is this talk is based on my upcoming book, CFO's Guide to Demystifying Internet Marketing. And uh, let's just jump right into the uh, presentation. Now, one reason why I wrote this book is uh, internet marketing and technology in general. This cartoon kind of shows how things are explained to non-technical managers and finance people. Like, they'll give us these answers. And I've, I've left many, many meetings with technical people not really understanding what was said, but yet somehow I have to prove their budget. And that bothered me in my entire career. So that's one reason why I decided to write this book. 
So let me start this discussion um, in a very non-technical way. Back in 2005, there is a Will Smith movie called Hitch in which Will Smith played um, Alex Hitch Hitchum, the so-called fate doctor. And um, what he did was he advised shy men, um, like how, how shy men can talk to the women of their dreams, all right? So they just did not know how to communicate. Um, and and I, I, was, I happened to be looking, probably the only one time in my life I was looking at the Oprah show. And at the time, uh, Will Smith was being interviewed back in 2005. And during the interview, he discussed his so-called three-date rule. And this really grabbed me. It, I just found this fascinating. So I thought I'd share Will Smith's three-date rule. So this is the rule. This is a dating rule for shy, socially awkward guys. They have got the first date, but they don't really know what to do on a date. They don't know what to say. You know, they're just afraid of embarrassing themselves. So advice for shy, socially awkward men, Will Smith. All right. So he says on the first date, um, you have really one job, and that is do not scare her off. All right. And I'll explain what that means in, in a second. You want to listen. You want to listen a lot. It's all about her, not about you. No weird stories that you think will impress her. So one, one true example, this one guy, he was so nervous. He didn't know what to say, so he blurted out, you know, um, my parole officer thinks I'm making very good progress, right? Like, that's going to scare her off, right? That's <laughs> too much information, right? So no weird stories. Just, just <clears throat> keep it very neutral, right? And your entire date, entire goal is to get date number two. That's really all you want to do. And just, just be you know, a quiet, neutral guy, good listener. All right. So now if you're lucky, you've got date number two. And he says, now you can open up a little bit. Okay to show your, your width and depth, <clears throat> you know, open up. So he says, as an example, once when he was single, he was, he was on a date and the topic was very broad. They were talking about 20th century current rap stars, but also um, German philosophers, Nishi, I think he, he lived in the mid 1800s. He was a guy that asked, you know, is there a God, right? And so here he's kind of shown his, his width and also the depth um, is one way of showing his depth. Uh, he also mentioned on the Oprah show, um, there's one thing he was on a date that the girl said something that reminded him of his grandmother. And he said, you know, you kind of remind me of my grandmother and, you know, not that you're older or anything, but she was, she was a part-time poet and um, she wrote a poem. And this thing that you said reminded me of her poem. And so then he started reciting this poem on a date, right? Like, you know, like totally unexpected. So here the date's thinking, wow, this guy is both wide he can discuss philosophers and rap artists, but also cite poetry, right? So now she's getting a really good idea of what Will Smith is like, right? So that's, um, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> my mouse uh, fell down, okay. Okay, and then, uh, sorry, let me make this a larger screen. <clears throat> okay, date number three was, um, let me, uh, okay, good. This is where he said, this is the make or break date. So in his way of thinking, you, 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 you wanna date someone no more than three times before deciding, should we continue or not, all right? You don't wanna drag it out, right? So date number three is the make or break date. Can we live with our differences? So for example, one 
one person might be, uh, say, an early bird wanting to um, go to the gym first thing in the morning and, and work out, stay in shape. And the other person might be, the other person might be, um, say, a late night um, night owl, just wants to surf the internet till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning and kind of a couch potato, right? So that's a difference, right? Uh, one person might be a meat-eating carnivore. They got to have their animal protein. And the other one might be, um, say, a vegan and very careful about their diet. Okay, so these are things that you need to know. One might be a smoker. The other one might not be a smoker. One might, when it comes to money, um, as soon as they get some extra um, income, some <clears throat> extra money to spend, might want to go out and splurge. The other one might have had say an economically deprived background and so might want to save pennies. So, you know, these are the things that you have to lay out on the table, according to Will Smith, and discuss this. And if you find that you can live with these differences, knowing full well what they are and still like each other, then, then yeah, you should uh, continue. And if not, then that's okay. You can, you can part friends. So this is uh, Will Smith's uh, three date rule. And I thought this is fascinating. I thought about this. And then soon afterwards, um, <clears throat> I, I wrote a blog on how his three-date rule could apply to business and marketing. So let's talk about that. And this, this applies when you're meeting with potential customers. And just like the first date, the first meeting is you really don't want to scare them off. You want to listen, you want to listen a lot. And at least in my experience, you know, even though I have plenty to say, clients really don't care what I had to say. They just wanted me to listen and it just made them feel good to get stuff off their chest, right? And so I learned as I became more and more experienced, just shut up, let them talk, right? And then if I was lucky, I would get meeting number two. So I'd have meeting number two. And this is like in a dating example, where you can show you're with, and also you adapt and open up a little. So showing you with, you might say, you know, we have a wide range of products and services, right? However, in evaluating what you've said, um, we would recommend, a, say, a very narrow product line for your market niche. I can give you examples of other people that are in the same boat as you. And so this might be a good fit for you, right? Okay, and then the third meeting, it's your make or break meeting. And a lot of companies don't have this, but I'd, I'd recommend um, you, you strongly consider this when you're evaluating a customer. You know, are we a fit? And at least in my business, I've come up with three criterion. One criterion, I might talk to a potential client is, um, number one, we're very collaborative people. We like a lot of ongoing, frequent communication. We want to know if we're doing a good job. And if we're not doing a good job, can we nip problems in the bud? Um, worst thing for us is you throw a bunch of money at us, and then all of a sudden you don't have time for meetings with us. So this forces us to become mind readers. And we're very good at what we do, but we're not mind readers. So that means we're gonna guess wrong some of the time. And in the end, you won't be happy, we won't be happy. So number one, we're looking for, if we're a good fit, you know, are you open to collaboration and communication? Second thing we look at is, are you open to new ideas? So when we work with, with people, uh, generally we'll find that, um, they've been doing the same thing over and over again. So we're probably gonna suggest things a little bit outside their comfort zone, but they'd be willing to take baby steps and try new things, right? And so uh, it's a warning flag if a company says, oh no, no, Roy, we don't do things that way. You know, there's a certain way we've done things forever and you know, we're just not gonna change. So right away we know that that's a flag and there might not be compatibility. The third criterion, at least in, in our case, is um, are you a company that's willing to take action? 
So we can have endless meetings, we can do uh, exhaustive analysis. However, if, if, if after everything, you know, you, you can't make up your mind or you have to run this through one committee after another, run this through your board and you're kind of petrified into inaction. And in the end, in the end of the day, all we've had is a series of pleasant social conversations and nothing's really done, right? And so I'd, I'd recommend if you're looking for a fit in the business world, this is one potential model. Um, are they collaborative people? Are they open to new ideas? And are they willing to take action? And if, if they are, then a long-term relationship makes sense. Uh, there's a high probability you succeed and everybody's gonna be happy. So um, this is my take on Will Smith's rule. So before I, um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, before I jump in, um, I'll pause it. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions or if you, have something if you just want to chat. If not, I'll, I'll proceed. Okay, so what does this have to do with internet marketing? All right, so the goal of internet marketing, believe it or not, is just, it's all about people, building relationships with people, but done online. That, that's really the big, big difference, all right? And so it's easy to get lost in technology, uh, talking about algorithms and website traffic and Facebook likes and keyword research and the like. But at the end of the day, you're gonna succeed in growing your business if essentially you attract the right audience and there's a match and there's a good fit for, for you and for them, right? And so this is really what technology is all about. And actually Google rewards companies that kind of keep that in mind you know, despite everything else about um, uh, <clears throat> keywords and analysis and algorithms, what, what, what the Google algorithm and other search engines are trying to do is bring like-minded people together and, 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 and kind, of, kind of grow the universe of satisfied customers and growing business. That's really what they're trying to do. Right? So, you wanna ask yourself as a CFO or as a business owner, <clears throat> do your website, social media, email campaign, they bring you closer to the right people who are a good fit for your business, all right? Because at the end of the day, they can throw a sea of numbers at you, but you have to ask yourself as a business leader, as a person approving the budget or not approving the budget, is this really gonna accomplish this goal? And if it is, then fine. Okay, so now uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to bring a non-technical handle to what's ordinarily a very technical type of discussion. Okay. So next topic, let's talk some dollars. There's quite a few finance people in here. Um, I think I invited several hundred Chicago MBAs uh, to this. Many of them, many of them accepted and they'll look at the recording of this, but, but we finance people, we wanna know how much should we spend on all this stuff, all right, uh, as a benchmark? So I thought I'd look at this almost like concentric circles. Let's take a look at the big circle. How much is spent, decent companies here in the US on total marketing? So here's a very simple pie chart, big picture revenue pie, where the, the whole circle here is total revenue. And in 2020, for American, uh, companies, the average spend was 12.6% of total revenue, all right? And this is for all forms of marketing, both online, like websites and social media, and also offline traditional, such as trade shows, such as print media, television commercials. So this is, this is everything. Now, there's a wide degree of fluctuation depending on industry. In general, the more B2B you are, then the less it's gonna be. So for example, um, like energy types of um, firms tend to be four to 6% of revenue. However, consumer products and con consumer services uh, tend to be closer to uh, like 24%. So this, this number 12.6 is an average. So this does not mean that your company should spend 12.6% 12 12 of your total revenue on marketing. 
it just kind of gives you a benchmark. In general, if you're more B2C, you want to spend more than that. If you're B2B, probably less than that makes sense. So now let's take a look at this slice of the pie, 12.6, and kind of dissect that. So you take this 12.6, and I split this up into two pies, two, two slices of the pie. One is traditional marketing, 50%, and the other one is internet marketing. So it turns out, on average, U.S. companies spend half of their marketing budget on traditional and half on internet marketing. All right, so this is good to know. In case you're wondering how much should we spend, all right? And then let's take a look at just the, this tan one right here. So I'm gonna take this and make this some pie chart. And here it is. This is also split 50-50 as it turns out. So this is the internet marketing piece of the pie. And as it turns out, it's split 50-50. 50% on something called search engine optimization. Many of you know what this is, but in case you don't, um, my de definition is essentially getting found on page one of Google without paying Google for paid advertising, all right? So it's also called organic or natural um, search engine marketing. So that's the tan, and then the other uh, is uh, other things like pay-per-click, social media, video marketing, email marketing, all right. So this kind of gives you a rough idea of how money is spent. So just to kind of recap, companies on average spend about 12.6 on all forms of marketing. They spend half of that on internet, and then they spend half of the internet on search engine optimization. So roughly 12%, 6%, 3%, just to give you rough Kentucky windage, right? In case you're wondering, am I overspending? Am I underspending, right? This should give you a rough, rough idea what companies are doing. And also you should know if you're in a B2B space, it's gonna be less than that. If you're in B2C space, it's gonna be more than that, right? Okay, so next. Um, come up with something called spending traps to avoid in internet marketing. And um, here, here's, here's seven, I'll go through them quickly. <clears throat> so Leanne and Barry, this is gonna be a fast presentation. I myself like to listen to short presentations and then go home early. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do that here unless people have questions. Okay, so the first trap is what we call vanity metrics. So what is a vanity metric? A vanity metric are a set of numbers that look good, they feel good, right? Uh, but, but are they real? All right, so um, here's an example vanity record metric. You might be talking to your web marketing guy or gal and they'll say, hey, you know, the number of website visitors is going up. It's going up and to the right. So we must be doing something right, right? So this looks good, this feels good. This is a vanity metric. And so, you know, you as a finance leader might say, okay, this is great, but how many of these people um, are ideal client leads? Tell me how many of these increased number of website visitors lead to meaningful conversations that could advance us to the sales funnel and translate into sales, right? So most of the time when you ask that question, the answer is gonna be crickets, like we don't know, right? <laughs> okay, so here's another example. Uh, they might say, hey, monthly revenue per customer is going up, aren't we doing a great job, right? And so you might wanna come back and say, okay, this is great, but let's take a look at the customer lifetime value for what we have to offer, right? right? How do we know that this increase in monthly revenue wasn't a blip because of a special sale or, or the sales team had a end of the quarter spiff, right? How do we know that we had a greater sales this month, but now in the following two or three months, it's gonna, it's gonna go down, right? You know, so customer lifetime value is a much better metric than monthly revenue, monthly revenue per customer. Another one, my favorite vanity is social media likes. Social media people say, hey, look at 
we got 10,000 likes on our Facebook page, right? Right, and we had 5,000 last month, so we must be doing something good. And, you know, if you're a typical finance person, you don't really know how to respond to this, right? So now you can say, okay, this is great. Tell me how many of these social media likes um, have led to referrals and engagements. Once again, can you show me numbers of how many of them have led to meaningful sales conversations, have led to uh, a, a deeper journey, customer journey into the sales funnel, and have led to more, more actual sales, right? And most of the time they won't have these numbers, but if you ask them for it, the answer's there, right? You just have to kind of prod them. So anyway, this is trap number one, falling for vanity metrics. Okay, trap number two, it's easy for the marketing people to overwhelm us with uh, Google Analytics and you can get hundreds and hundreds of pages of numbers, printouts back in the days when we had computer printouts of sea of numbers, uh, the Google database, it's immense and they can throw a bunch of numbers at you and, and you will be snowed unless you can really kind of figure out what's going on. So. Um, one way of navigating the sea of numbers is to consider three things, no matter what metrics they're, sh <clears throat> they're showing you, uh, ask them three things, the past, the future and idealized future. So the past is what I call descriptive. That's what happened. Okay, so they're really good at telling you this is what happened, right? And then predictive, this is the future. This is their take on based on current trends, this is what we think is gonna happen, all right? So sales is going up 5% and we think it's gonna go up for the next 90 days. Okay, fine. And then the third thing was something almost nobody bothers to take a look at, but which they really should. It's prescriptive in nature. So how can we take the future and make it better, right? Okay, so you say um, it's sales are gonna go up 5% in the next quarter, that's great. What does it take to make it 10%? What do we have to do, right? right? Can you come up with, with any ideas, right? And so um, most of the time you get crickets, but still, you know, part of the time, you know, when I was in finance, I always wanted control of the conversation and I didn't really know how to control the conversation. So this is one way of controlling that conversation. So, uh, <clears throat> So like, you know, here, here's an example. They might talk about website revenue discussion. They might say, hey, you know, website revenue, it's, it's gone up X percent. And so you can come back with, okay, uh, descriptive, we've seen the past, what's it gonna be? And then, you know, what, what can we do to make it better, right? So this is something that really as finance people and as business owners, we really should ask, right? But we don't know enough to ask. I mean, all the information is there, right? They just don't want to present it, right? Okay, so the third trap called the field of dreams fallacy. So, you know, if you're a baseball fan, you'll know that recently was it the White Sox and the Yankees had a game in, in Iowa. And so many businesses mistakenly think that if they build a website, they will come, right? And so my response is, you know, unless you're Kevin Costner or Steve Jobs, I got news for you, they're not gonna come, <laughs> okay, right? So many times I'll get calls from clients and say, hey, we spent all this money on this website, sometimes hundreds of thousand dollars or even one case over a million dollar website and there's no traffic at all. And the reason being is the website by itself is not going to, draw traffic, you need a marketing plan. And without a marketing plan, just gonna sit there, um, you know, almost like an expensive, um, you know, imaginary paperweight, right? So you need a marketing plan. And I have lots more to say on this, but I'm gonna go on to the next point. Um, here, here's one of my favorite pet peeves, uh, inadequate lead follow-up, all right? So a lot of companies, um, fail to follow up. And so marketing, they'll spend a lot of money in generating leads. You know, I, I know when I was working in Silicon Valley, 
uh, marketing would come to me and say, you know, we need uh, $200,000 for this trade show in San Francisco. You know, we need, we need a booth. We have to be there. All the competitors will be there. We have to be there. We got to spend this money, right? And so they kind of twist my arm, making me feel that, okay, you know, if you don't approve this, Roy, then don't blame us, right? And so, you know, one thing I didn't know back then, I didn't know to demand accountability. You know, whatever happened to the leads last time? Okay, so you're saying you want, you know, 200,000 for this trade show in San Francisco. You know, what about last year when we did spent the same amount of money in Denver? Can you show me a list of those leads and what you've done with those leads and the sales produced from that, right? And then that's going to make them feel very uncomfortable because they're always looking for new worlds to conquer. And nobody wants to get on the phone and do dialing for dollars again and again and again, right? But that's really where the real money is in sales and marketing. Steve Rosefald, he's, he's in on this call. I'm going to pitch him. He runs this excellent, excellent business called a CFO at university. And he'll tell you all about this stuff, all right? Real money is to be made. In, in the follow-up. So there's a couple of points. There's something called rule of six and rule of six, many of you know this, but uh, in, in sales, uh, th th this applies to follow-up. So uh, if you get a sales lead, say from a trade show, uh, almost everybody follows up once. And then after once, 90% uh, of companies do not follow up again. All right. And then, um, you see a follow up the second time, nothing happens. Third time, nothing happens. Fourth, fifth time, nothing happens. Something magical happens somewhere around the fifth or sixth or seventh time when if you keep badgering the customer enough, the no's and the I'm too busy start to turn into yeses or yes, let's set up a meeting, right? It's not like customers are mean or, or you know, just not interested. It's just that they're distracted and they need to be reminded again and again and again that, hey, you you attended this trade show. You you submitted this lead, right? You know, there must be some interest. So, you know, let, let's let's follow up on this. And something magical happens after after about about the six leads. So, you know, ask your sales and marketing team, show me how many times you followed up, right? If the magic number is not six, then you'll say, you know, before I approve this budget for San Francisco, you're going to have to demonstrate to me that you're going to follow up, right? And then there's something I call the 4% rule. And what, what that is, when you're talking to sales prospects, if you're talking to an average of 25 qualified leads, on average, only one out of 25, and that's 4%, is ready to buy now, all right? So they're ready to buy now, just a timing thing. And means 24 out of 25 are not ready to buy, but they've shown some interest, right? And so what do sales teams normally do? They just kind of, like I said in rule six, they just kind of give up. They'll say, hey, Roy, we called and they said, no, what are we supposed to do? And I'll say, look, <clears throat> you got to keep trying and trying and trying because the real money is made not on that one out of 25 that converted, but the 24 out of 25 that's 96% of, of the market that you're, the qualified lead market that, that, you're, that you're ignoring, right? Okay. And so you must follow up on them and they will turn into sales leads. Here's something called the infinity stories. You know, one of my clients from some years ago, um, some lady responded to an email marketing campaign and, you know, they, they talked with her and 24 months went by before she finally sold. She, she finally bought a car, but they, they put her on automatic pilot and kept on giving her information and a model that she was interested in. I mean, sometimes people are just not ready to buy, but if your sales and marketing team are just simply pers persistent enough, they will get that sales. All right. So this is, this, this is really where a lot of money to be made, to be made on virtually zero, <clears throat> you know, uh, additional um, uh, investment. No, my pet peeves. Okay. Number five, not knowing what to ask. We need help. So when you're building your program, you may need outside help. You may need to hire an outside agency. So you need to know what to ask, you know, to determine if you're a good fit. And earlier in the conversation, I talked about 
three of my personal favorites, collaboration and willing to explore new ideas and willing to take action. But, but there's a set of questions that, that you could ask and you know, if anybody's interested, I could provide those on, on request. And really, actually, when you're talking about hiring somebody to help you with your web marketing program or, or just anybody in general, they should have a bunch of questions for you. And if they don't, that's that's a flag too. So I, I could talk an hour on that, but I'm gonna go on. Okay, number six, uh, ignoring high margin, low cost technology. And I'm talking about good old snail mail and email. So you don't want to overlook low tech marketing and something that your sales and marketing team, they don't really want to spend time in because it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, we get it, right? But really email marketing really is the best ROI it is. If it's done right, you'll get $42 worth of return for every dollar spent, right? But how many um, marketing teams really want to uh, create email marketing campaigns and then run it again and again and again. There's really no excuse because it's all it's it's all automated anyway, right? But yet, uh, very few companies um, do that. And snail mail, right? And so you might think, boy, that's really old school. Nobody does snail mail. But I have this question: Guess who uses snail mail? I'll pause here. Uh, you'll be surprised. All right. So I, I see Steve grinning. He probably knows the answer. Okay. So I okay. I won't. I won't leave you a mystery. Google uses snail mail, right? It will send out postcards <laughs> saying, this is our latest product and services. Okay, so they're number one, right, in the internet marketing world. So look at, if snail mail is good enough for Google, it's something that you and your business should not really overlook, right? High margin, low tech, right? And then good thing about snail mail is hardly anybody uses it anymore, right? In fact, you know, a, a good friend of mine, sales coach, he might be in on this call, Scott Merritt, a friend of mine and my sales coach for many years. Uh, he's a brilliant marketer and he's, he's come up with um, snail mail campaigns using, using FedEx and, and, and UPS. And when it's done right, it really, really works. Okay, so the last thing right here, uh, going after markets all at once, trying to be all things with all people. So this is what's known as shotgun marketing versus narrow niche marketing. So uh, I'm a fan of marketing to narrow, tiny niches. And so what you want to do is think like World War II, the Normandy beachhead marketing. I mean, you know, the, the allies, if, if you're World War II buff, you know, they could have attacked everywhere at once. They could attack from Eastern Europe. They could attack from Mediterranean. They could attack from Africa. They could attack from uh, from uh, from Normandy. But but it, it would have spread their resources out too thin and it would have failed. So they put everything into one narrow beachhead and then dominated, then they expanded. So I see a lot of companies going out there attacking everywhere at once, and their resources dissipated over a wide area. So my recommendation is you want to expand your beachhead and expand from there. And I have tons of stories, anecdotes, but yet I see I see Mark, I, I see companies make this mistake all the time. Trying to see, be all things to all people. Okay. So anyway, let's see. Um, here's a quick summary. And I, I guess I should have one over a slide I'm concluding about how um, the three-day rule is a good way of really building a good relationship with your potential clients. Because, I mean, you know, we're in the internet marketing age, but really a sales is made, you know, like one sales at a time, right? Um, and, and so it's about um, listening to people, you know, determining if you're a good fit, right? And then and, and just, just doing it accordingly. And so we have these tools. We have websites, we have social media, we have email, we have video marketing, but all they're really designed to do is just accelerate and enhance this, this um, you know, the, this positive experience. So um, 
let's see, I guess it's, <clears throat> I wanted to keep this shorter than it was. Um, that's all I got. Um, I'll open this up to questions. <clears throat> I don't know, Barry, did you wanna moderate or do people oh, sure. wanna raise their hands? Okay. Sure. Yes, yeah, so Roy, thank you. That is some really good information that you just went over. I found it very interesting. And a couple of people had some questions here in the chat hey. box that oh, I okay. want to go over. Oh, okay. um, so first of all, Mike Tamaru said that the technology is great. Um, the like audiences feature in Facebook ad manager helps him with his direct to consumer company, zero in on relevant prospects, track the lead funnel, drive conversion. And he says he used to have to do that on spreadsheets and gut feel. Uh, however, he said it would be great to get when you were talking about the, the percent of dollars spent, um, mm -hmm. it would be great to get metrics by industry. In enterprise oh. software, he spent 32 to 45% of revenue on sales and marketing. At consumer products and electronic companies, he spent 28 to 35%. So he said that 12 to 13% seems a really low number, perhaps skewed by industry. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and so um, as I may have mentioned, um, you know, if you're more into the B2C space more to you know the wide consumer market as opposed to um say the b2b you're going to find that now i'm surprised he spent that that much but it could be um his his area might have been in the early phase of it where it's very natural to spend 40 or even 50 percent on the marketing and so uh, my numbers really pertain more to mature industries however if he wanted to reach out to me uh say offline uh, here, here's my email address. I can give him some information by industry, which which I do have. Okay, that would be great. He also wanted to know if you or anyone else uh, he has metrics regarding the impact of Apple iOS 14.5, which allows consumers to opt out of tracking. He heard that on some platforms, the opt-out rate is 60% or more, and that would undermine Facebook's ability to track every site or page that the consumer is visiting. That is such an excellent question. You know, that's, that, that's currently in the news right now, right? And many people, um, probably myself included, kind of feel uncomfortable with, you know, are we moving closer to George Orwell, Big Brothers watching you kind of thing? So this is a very, very new um, thing currently in the news. I do not have uh, numbers on that, but I'm sure, um, I, I think you mentioned 50 or 60%, maybe even more opting out. I probably would opt out as well too. But if I do find some stuff, once again, uh, if Mike wants to send me his email information, I'd be happy to share whatever I do come across. But that, that that's such an excellent question. Thank you. Sounds very relevant for now. Yes. Um, so Doug Hunter has a question to the group and you, Roy, which is sometimes don't you need to go broad to figure out what works and then focus in on d those discrete areas where you have success? Uh, he's referring to when you were speaking about the niche marketing. Yes. Okay. So here's, here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm going through all these anecdotes in, in my head. So, uh, okay, okay I'll I just, I just give this one story. This is maybe 15, almost 20 years ago. I was talking to this one lady who, who ran uh, a, a translation and interpretation business, and she was having no luck at all getting clients um, through, her, through her marketing. And so I asked her, well, you know, what languages do you kind of deal with? And she said, believe it or not, um, practically every language, we can do all the romance languages, French, Spanish, uh, Italian, Portuguese. We could do Chinese, we can do Russian, we could do Serbo Croatian, we could do Japanese. I mean, you know, we're, we're pretty, pretty broad, but, but, but no, no one would no one really, um, you know, we're just not getting traction. 
So then I asked her, well, um, that's great. What, um, <clears throat> what what area do you think you, you've had some amount, some modicum of success? You know, which language? And she, says, she said, well, I'm Hispanic. And so, you know, I guess we're pretty good in Spanish. And then recently we've had um, a small number of legal clients, especially around the courthouse, courthouse, courthouse area where um, uh, say immigration attorneys and so forth would need help with translation and interpretation, say birth certificates or um, a visa documents or graduation certificates and so forth or testifying in court. So we said, you know, well, it, it's a start. Uh, why don't you focus your scarce work marketing dollars just on, on Hispanic translation for, for legal purposes, right? She didn't have much money, so she did. And it was slow at first, but pretty soon, since she focused on a narrow niche, uh, she became more and more well-known in that niche. And then over time, people would call her and they'd say, hey, um, do you do French? Do you do Russian? Do you do Chinese, right? And so in that way, she established a beachhead and from that she was able to expand, right? And so like, you know, like Doug was alluding to, it's, it's, it's tempting to go out there and throw a wide net and kind of see, you know, what sticks, right? And, and so if you've got the dollars and the time to do that, you know, that, that's one approach. But another approach would be just to pick a niche that you've had some amount of success and then sort of build on that, right? So mm -hmm. once again, if I didn't answer that question, uh, Doug, please reach out to me and uh, I, I, can, I can give you more information than that. But certainly hope that helped a little bit. Yes, it was a good anecdote, Murray. Yeah. Good explanation. So Scott Merritt has a question. He would like to know what you see as emerging trends in internet marketing. Oh, Scott Merritt. One of the smartest guys I know. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so um, this is a study actually printed out uh, in 2020 by Deloitte in which um, they alluded to that. And um, it's really kind of interesting. They say that uh, when they compare 2020 with 2019, digital sales growth grew by 18% and they, they, they see that trend continuing. But also they say that certain segments like uh, do-it-yourself and home goods saw astonishing growth, something like 70% in 2020 over 2019, right? And so some areas grew a lot and some, um, you know, not so much. And then here's something interesting that came across. Um, companies do their web marketing in what's known as silos. So there might be the website silo, there might be the social media silo, there might be the email, email marketing silo. And so, customers get pinged by all these different silos. And they're saying that about 60% of the people feel that when one company reaches out to them to these different marketing channels, that it feels like they're communicating with separate departments and not one company. The reason for this is because they say that they keep having to re-explain issues to the same company, but just different people, right? And so this is feedback for um, companies that do want to do web marketing, customers, especially when it comes to customer service, right? <clears throat> they only want to explain their issues just once. So make sure you have a coordinated message and a coordinated way of handling these, these issues. But uh, once again, if anybody would like a copy of this uh, report. It, it goes on into great detail on future of the future of digital marketing and other trends. And I wanna thank Scott for throwing out that question. Hopefully it touched on this just a little bit. 
So our next question is, and forgive me if I pronounce your last name wrong, um, incorrectly, is from Steve Rosvold. Oh, yeah, Steve. I think that's correct, yes. Um, he says that SEO results seem to be nebulous and the rules ever-changing. That's a quote from a number of SEO providers. How much effort would you suggest clients put into SEO? Okay, yeah, Steve is Steve's a <clears throat> really good friend of mine. He, he's also a Chicago MBA. So I got to be careful what I say because he's very, very smart. But yes, um, uh, yeah, talking about the issue of SEO results being nebulous, I would say that a large part of it is the way the SEO marketing is, is um, set up. All right. And so a large part of it is is there the type of focus that I may have alluded to um, when it comes to, for example, niche marketing? So if you get nebulous results, it might be that your your, your target market was was way too broad, right? Same thing with social media, but especially um, <clears throat> SEO. SEO really works when when the content is clearly focused and just resonates to whatever target market you're trying to reach, right? And so I would suggest to that to that SEO team, maybe take a look at that and maybe scale back on, on who you're trying to reach. You know, maybe just a little bit of being too much, uh, all things to all people. So um, I, I know that this is more of a social media example, but we, but we are helping um, like PI attorneys and, and one niche that we came up with was uh, female, Hispanic CPAs, age 35 to 55. And that's a very, very highly specialized niche, but there are enough numbers uh, in, in the Las Vegas market where, where there are enough numbers of those people where you can make a lot of money just targeting to, to that particular niche. There's another example from some years ago, we were working with a wealth management company and they were saying, hey, you know, we're doing all this web marketing, we're not getting anything. So we took a look at their target market base and like everybody else are trying to be all things to all people. So we found out their ideal client was um, typically Caucasian, middle-aged, um, uh, males who are uh, professionals, either one of three professions, CPAs, uh, medical professionals, and, and, and attorneys, right? And so we said, okay, that's your target market right there. They can afford your wealth management services. And then see, that's, that's the demographic approach. And then you do the psychographic, which is getting inside the head of the customer. You know, what are they thinking? So you send out surveys, and then one thing we found was, you know, these these middle aged um, Caucasian males earning six figures a year, um, around thirty seven or forty percent of them surprisingly said that they listed gardening as a as a hobby or something that just made them feel like less stress. So it's something you could not predict. So we said, hey, you know, why don't you start writing gardening tips in your blog, right? Just gardening tips. And actually their business increased by something like 17 or 18% just from publishing gardening tips, right? So really what I'm trying to say is you gotta know your target market. And if you're not getting good results, just keep digging and digging and digging. Um, I mean, there are a lot of nuggets to be, to be mined out there. And so, um, you know, if, if you do a better do job of digging than your competition, you really will um, get a uh, lion's share of the market. So hope that helps. Good advice, Roy. Now, don't be surprised if you get another 20 newsletters in the mail <laughs> how to fertilize your roses. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So um, Gary Laney has a question for oh, you, Gary. which is, what is a good balance between internet digital type marketing and traditional marketing? Okay. Hey, you know, Gary's another super genius guy. Um, 
he just wrote a book on strategic marketing. Sorry, Gary, I forgot the name of the book. You might want to type it in the chat room, but it's an instant bestseller. I strongly urge everybody to go out there and get Gary Laney. Book. Very, very smart guy. Um, Northwestern MBA, we won't hold that against them. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, but anyway, Gary's question, I believe, was what, what's a good mix of, of internet marketing and traditional marketing? And so if we were talking generalities uh, across all companies, a good starting point would be 50-50, but still you wanna be sensitive to what's working say quickest and most effectively. So you're gonna find a shift in, in the balance, 60, 40. And so whatever seems to be working, um, wanna throw more marketing dollars in, in that. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a theory of, of, of marketing and of businesses where uh, you, you wanna go out there, experiment and fail as quickly as you can, right? And, and from that learn, and just, it's, it's, it's like a, a cycle, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. And then the actual numbers and, and your target audience will tell you what is working. So, um, you know, just experiment on very, very small dollars. Like, you know, you can run Facebook ads and, you know, at one time, I think a Facebook ad was like five cents or something. Those days might be gone. But, you know, you just throw, you know, a few hundred dollars, you know, in Facebook advertising and you could find out quickly what's, what's working without putting in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you can use that as a pilot program. In fact, that might partially answer, um, I think, uh, Doug's question earlier, right? So anyway, don't know if that answered the question, but Gary, thanks for asking it. Yeah. So those are all the questions I've received so far in the chat box. Sure. Um, I'd like to, if you're up for it, we can open it up to the group um, and go ahead and feel free to vocalize any comments or questions you have from for Roy. It sure is a quiet bunch for a group oh, of booth people. No, it's okay. It's, it's Thursday just before the weekend. <laughs> like I said, I myself do <laughs> not like long presentations. And I'm looking at the clock. It's like one hour, probably dinner time or past dinner time for most people. So, if if it's okay with with everybody, we, we can just end here. And if somebody does have a follow up question, you know, there, there's my contact information. I'd be okay. happy to answer answer any any follow up question. Well, thank you so much, Roy, for all of the excellent information. I personally would be going to pick up a copy of your book and I typed the title of Gary's book in the chat box. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I also yeah. wanted to mention that if anyone here is interested in presenting on a topic just as Roy did that you may have expertise in or would be interested in hosting an event for our lovely club, please feel free to contact me directly. Um, I typed my contact information in the chat as well. Um, but barring any other questions or comments, I wanna thank you for all of your time. And I hope that your paths uh, will cross with mine sometime in the future at an event. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Presentation. Thanks, Thanks Roy. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Leanne. Cheers. Good evening. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye.